to win it yes we are in it to win it we got to keep up the momentum we got to keep going because we are in it to win it just like mr ash mufara says so thank you guys so much for coming and i highly appreciate all of you here for really taking the time to support uh children supporting one global movement and supporting children all over the world and this is how important it is. That's why we always come here to make sure that we are doing the right thing that is going to reach every child in the world, no matter who or what that child is. We're going to have to reach each and every child with no child being left behind. 
So thank you guys so much for everything. You could have been somewhere else doing something, but you decided that we are going to do this together because it's not a one month job. It's not even a job for, for 1,000 people. We all need to be in it because 195 countries is not a joke. But when we break down things into manageable um, portions, then little by little, we're reaching these children through us who are 1.4 million founders. And they, these are accounts, 1.4 million accounts, not even just founders, because some people have more than 1,000 accounts. Because if you put together all these accounts, because these accounts are designated to different names or different projects, then we have more than 3 million founding accounts. So this is how important it is. Like somebody like me, I have just my one account, which I don't even work on. But... I want to work on one global movement because this is the account that is going to help every child in the world, which we all are here working on it. So thank you guys so much. And uh, I need people that can be uh, uh, reaching out to their various communities, their various villages, because a lot of people, they don't know that there is one global movement. And we need families to know so that when families know, their children will also know so that these children can be watching One Global Movement, uh, uh, these valuable tools, so that instead of watching um, on clean TV or certain things that are not good for their eyes and their souls, they can be watching these tools here knowing that these tools are going to help them. Because the mindset things that we are doing here, the mindset tools, is the number one. Because if a child... A child's mind is not well nourished and built. This child will always look low upon themselves. They will think that they don't belong, that they don't amount to anything. These are mindset uh, tools because a lot of our kids around the world have been so beaten psychologically and they don't know what they are doing. And they think that that is just the way it's going to be for them. They don't know that they can rise above their circumstances and still do better in life. So the whole world is almost using smartphones. Some places the internet is difficult, but we want to go into, um, into uh, uh, youth organizations, into schools, if you can. You have to ask before you go. You go into your families, into your communities, friends, and, and some people you need to help them. Help them with subscribing to One Global Movement because why? We want to grow. When we grow One Global Movement, all the funnels of, uh, of resources that we want to get, then it is growing the children all over the world. We need resources. And so one of the ways that uh, some of us can help is helping people subscribe to One Global Movement and then talk to them about One Global Movement. I am going to be uh, sending out um, a mission statement about One Global Movement and I might even post it online so that people can see what we are all about. And you can take it from there because you can't just go and uh, uh, help somebody to subscribe to One Global Movement without explaining to them what One Global Movement is all about. We need to talk to them. They need to know what we are doing. And then we give them that opportunity to go and watch, to see if that is something for them. And which I know it is, unless uh, they're in a different mindset. So these are good tools. And we can help people to subscribe so that when it grows, when we grow this One Global Movement YouTube channel, we're also growing, uh, growing our children all over the world. So this is very, very important. But thank you guys so much for being here again and again and again. Check out Stephanie is here. And thank you so much. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much. And uh, we're just going to dive into the topic for today, or which is uh, the Mindset Series number 40. It talks about, let's talk about food and cultural delicacies for children. Let's talk about food. I know that when I say that, I just start salivating, you know, like I want to eat something. So let's talk about food and cultural delicacies for children. We all know that we come from different cultures, different orientations, different backgrounds, and different methods of, of maybe gardening, preparing food, and different ways of preparing uh, the same dishes for uh, different cultures. And we want to talk about this like... 
it's our own culture. We are doing it the way that we were taught to do it, right? And sometimes we learn other ways of preparing these uh, dishes, right? And I learn, I like to learn a variety because it's good to offer variety or choices to children so that they can choose what they love to eat. So, and, uh, you know, there is, a, we did this food thing at the beginning of One Global Movement shows. We have delicious, delicious, yummy dishes that we're passing on the screen. We don't want to do that here now because uh, it's going to take more than an hour. So there will be a time for that. We'll bring those dishes back. And uh, we want to make sure that the dishes that we're talking about, when they say delicacies, it's not just because they, are, they taste good, they're delicious. In terms of good health, what are those foods doing to our health? That is very important. What, are, what is it doing to the health of our children? Are we just eating because it is food? What is it doing for you? If it's doing good for you, it therefore means that it's going to do good for the children as well. So again, the mindset series is number 40. And the theme is let's talk about food and cultural delicacies for children. Right? This is very important. So we always like to begin with a quote. A recipe has no soul. And uh, uh, Sharon reminded me about uh, this quote from Thomas Keller. Thomas Keller, I really love what he says. He says, a recipe has no soul. You as a cook must bring soul to the recipe. Remember that a recipe has no soul. But you as a cook can bring soul to the recipe. Very important. So what are the cultural delicacies or cultural foods that we love? Begin to put your own cultural foods in the chat there, the ones that you, you really love and the ones that you know that they are healthy for you and your, and your family. So you begin to put there. For me, I am going to be discussing this uh, based from my own culture in Cameroon, the culture that I was brought in before learning uh, about other uh, food delicacies around the world. So cultural delicacies are foods that hold special significance or meaning within a particular culture or religion. Yes, it holds a significant meaning, value within a particular culture or religion. And it is food, of course. What does it stand for? We know that food stands for a lot of things. Food is love, right? Food is relationship. Food is uh, uh, it's, uh, sacrifice. Food is, is bonding. Food is, um, food is a lot of things. Food represents a lot of things. It is life. If we don't eat we cannot leave, right? We'll get sick and eventually we'll die. So food has a lot of symbolic meaning in all our cultures. So, but which one are so symbolic to you? Which, which one has the most significance and why? Why does it have that significance to you? So begin to put it in the chat there. I love to read from all of you so that I can expand my, my horizon when it comes to food delicacies around the world. So... These are uh, uh, significant dishes or food delicacies often reflect the history of that particular place. Yes, food reflects history, like how people used to eat. They pass it down from one generation to the other. And then it also symbolizes the tradition, like I said, and the value of that community or the village. And they may require significant ingredients like significant ingredients, different kinds of ingredients. Not every ingredient is going to work for every dish. Every dish comes with its own specific and special ingredients, right? And we know all of that. Sometimes, you know, a special kind of onion, or maybe some, some will use the red onion, some will use the white onion. They know why they are doing that because of the significance of that dish in their cultural context. It's so important. And uh, they may require, yes, specific way of preparation as well and uh, specific methods, different ways of cutting things and into different sizes or serving customs to be considered authentic. 
very, very important. And certain measurements as well, especially in the case of baking, we have to measure things. Otherwise, they will not turn out right. But for me, I come from a culture where the only thing that we can measure is like when you're baking something like a cake or when you're baking, you've got to, or you're preparing what is called puff puff in my culture. Very delicious, very yummy, I'm telling you. And someday we're going to be cooking it in the One Global Movement restaurant, right? So it requires measurement in those cases, but often we just cook. And because we already know it's like it's already ingrained inside of us, it's already downloaded. So we just cook and more than 90% of the time, it just turns out well without any measurement. So that is very important. So cultural delicacies can vary widely from one region or one place or one culture to another. Ranging, it ranges from exotic and rare ingredients to humble, to humble yet cherish local specialties. Always, always. And they are often celebrated and uh, as expressions of culinary artistry and are frequently associated with festivals, celebrations, birthdays, family gatherings, and customs and traditions. So examples can include Nantar, I give you this one because that is what I know. That is the number one delicacy in my culture where I was born and I grew up. It's called Nantar in the cultural way. But if I want to explain it, it's going to take a little bit of explanation. Like you have these cocoa yams with a sweet bitter leaf with smoked meat, smoked meat and smoked fish, smoke over the, the, the fire because the smoke gets into it. It gives it the real, real taste that is suited for that particular dish to be prepared. So smoked meat, you have the bitter leaves, and then we use palm oil. Palm oil, they can be cocoa yams or they can be plantains. What does plantain do? Plantain is the number one source of potassium for our bodies. Our bodies need potassium more than the tablets that we buy in the store. That is the number one defense. And you can just get that from fresh foods instead of from tablets. But you want to make sure that you're consistent. So the tablets are there sometimes for just for supplements because sometimes we are not consistent in the way we eat the things that nourish our bodies well. So you, you want to do that. So nangtar, that is what it is. And then you cook it over the open fire, three stone fireplace, not on the gas cooker, but right now here, I don't, um, like during winter, we have the three stone fireplace, almost like a campfire back uh, at my backyard. We can use that during uh, summer. But in winter, we can use it because it's cold. So now we are forced to improvise, look for other ways in cooking that and we'll use the stove. It really doesn't turn out well because we're using the stove. But if we cook at the open uh, fireplace, the smoke and everything, it makes it so. And when people eat it, I used to take some to my job and people be like, what is this? Can I try? I said, sure. And they will try. They love it. They love it. They love it. And people just get so used to other people's way of eating because their food tastes good. Sometimes when you look at the food with your eyes, you'll be like, but what is this? Uh -uh, I don't know what. And then you'll be making your nose. But the moment you taste it, that's why they say don't judge a book by its cover. You know, you have to read the book to know what is inside the book. And it's the same thing too with certain dishes. When uh, you just look at them, you'll be like, oh, because you're not used to, you don't know. You think it doesn't taste good, but actually it tastes yummy and healthy for the body. So nangtare, that is number one. Then achu and achu, achu is another, this one, um, they use it a lot when you are cooking to go uh, to to go and uh, give it to the palace to the king and the queen this is one of the most special ones it takes time it takes um, maybe you have to start looking for the ingredients and everything for days before you you actually cook it it really takes time and when you do this people respect you because of the kind of meats the exotic meats that go in there, the kind of ingredients, and some of these ingredients grow on uh, only palm trees. You can see it anywhere. It grows on palm trees, and that's where it grows. 
and it grows so well you you wouldn't believe it and some of it um i don't even know the names for the for the english names for these things but that is why it's called traditional delicacies or that is symbolic to that particular uh, uh tradition so that one if you do it and it is tight the the it's like um it almost like a mashed potatoes but this one they are cocoa yams you pound them in the mortar very well or nowadays we use the machine to grind it and then it's it's easy that way but in the village nobody wants that machine they have to do it with the hand the mortar and the pistol you know brick and mortar so when they do it that way it turns out so good and you have to come and see how people are eating you uh, before we used to eat from the same bowl but nowadays because of all of these um uh illnesses and other things people are advised not to eat from the same bowl you know so when it is time we have a basket full of it they're tied little by little in plantain leaves and the soup is um is a yellow soup it's called a chew soup that soup cleanses your system you know when my son was graduating from school that's one of the dishes that we prepared and uh, i bet you people came from all walks of life to attend my son's graduation. And I was surprised that uh, some of my uh, my uh, family friends' Caucasians, they, they ate, they ate, and they took some home, just like we do in the village. You eat, you think about the children, you think about your family, you are allowed to take some of it home. That is cultural. And so uh, this uh, family came, especially the, the husband, came and said uh, th that thing helped him. With his stomach, which is one of the things that that yellow soup is meant for. It cleanses your system. And so when he said that, I said, wow, he's never eaten it. And now he ate, he ate it for the first time and it's working. So it works a lot. And every now and then he would just call or text us and say, I want to come and visit. Can you ask Mama Lucy, that's my mom, Lucy, to prepare some of the, that yellow soup again? And uh, that's what he's been using to cleanse his system. You know, it can turn out differently for different people. And I'm not saying that you don't even know it because there's no way you're going to eat it. I always advise people, eat little by little for a, a period of three days or, or one week and see if it works for you. Because some people can be allergic to, to such kind of food. You don't just eat it, right? So that is a chew. And uh, we have uh, Ekwang. Ekwang, oh my goodness. You have to, it's cocoa yams. You, you, you peel it, you wash it, you start grating it with your hand. But like I say, technology is out there. You can just blend it in the, there's a specific kind of blender that you cut the, uh, the cocoa yams into little pieces. You drop it in there, you blend it, and then you look for these colored greens. In my village, the sweet bitter leaf is what we use. And here, there's no sweet bitter leaf most of the time. So we use the colored greens. We have to improvise. We use the colored greens from the store or there's some other kind of vegetable at the store. I've forgotten the name. But then you can use uh, a cocoa yam leaves. I have planted cocoa yams here. It takes time to be ready. But it didn't do well because the cold came before time and killed everything, but it was doing well. So a lot of, you can just improvise different kinds of vegetables that are healthy for you. And what we do is when you grate it, you sprinkle a little bit of salt in there and uh, you mix it up, mix it up. You can sprinkle a little bit of a chicken bouillon. You mix it up. If you, somebody who eats a uh, uh, hot spicy pepper, you can put there, you you mix it up and then you cut your leaves now into uh, cute sizes that you go. And then you just take a little, you put, you wrap it, wrap it, wrap it. You put it in the pot. You have to have lined the bottom of the pot with a little bit of palm oil. Then you keep wrapping. It takes time. And all of these things are very expensive. That's why when people go to some of the African stores, they complain that the things are expensive because they eat from scratch. They prepare their things from scratch and their foods are very expensive because they are all organically produced. Yes. And uh, this Ekwang, people, when you cook it for somebody, that person knows that you thought about them because this one takes even a longer time than the actual. So... 
We have a lot, lot, lot roasted fish, roasted fish with um, what is called bobolo. Bobolo is a name in Cameroon where uh, uh, something that is made out of cassava tuba, but it tastes good. It they let it ferment a little bit. It tastes good when you eat it with roasted fish. You'll be like, mm. but you can still eat roasted fish with your bread. You can still eat roasted fish with plantains. All of these things, by the grace of God, someday we're going to meet and we're going. I'm going to cook and we're going to eat. A lot, lot, lot of other things that uh, are considered delicacies in Cameroon culture. Cameroon is in West Africa and they cook so well. They are very gifted in cooking. So now I'm also going to, to talk about others that are out of our culture because I've eaten those here. I don't know how to prepare them, but I just buy. We talk about uh, sushi in Japan, right? And then Pella in Spain. And then Putin in Canada and baklava, baklava in the Middle East, baklava. So these are different, different uh, delicacies that come from different regions of the world. And now with Unpassive, we can learn uh, more about people's uh, food and way of life, their language, their way, way of dressing. Food in particular, food brings people together. When people don't eat, they cannot do anything. They can't. So food, we place so much emphasis on food. Food is very important all over the world. And so learning about these different delicacies is very good for our children, you know, because uh, like I, when I traveled to South Korea and the way that they were eating, I loved it. Most of their foods were seafoods and I just blended in and I loved it. But I, and then we were even eating in a restaurant where you already have the, the stove and everything right there. You got to cook your own shrimps. They measure everything all up with the ingredients and everything. You just put it there. And you guys are eating very hot food. Nice. I'm telling you. So these things are different. So begin to put your own. I know that uh, uh, Esther from Canada, Esther is going to teach me uh, some two delicacies from the Nigerian culture. And I'm going to, I'm just waiting for the day that I'll learn that. Because when we learn these things, we meet, we prepare a variety, and then we get to pick and choose, or we get to taste, and our children get to eat, or pick whatever they want. This is very, very good, you know? This is cool. I love it. I love it. I love it. So now let's look at some of uh, the delicacies and their cultural significance. I just named those ones, and I've given that, but then it's important to let our children know that cultural delicacies vary widely from one country one culture to another, often reflecting a combination of historical, geographical, and social influences. Always, nothing is the same because we are different and we are created differently for a good reason. So we have uh, uh, some samples of delicacies from different countries and their significance. Now, I am going to, we begin, let us help our children. We want to help our children to understand these, uh, these different kinds of food and how important they are, the general importance and the significance of the food itself to their bodies, which I name like the, the Ekwang, the, 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 the Achu, and the Nangtar from Cameroon. Because, oh, two, three, seven, uh -oh. Seven, seven, somebody's eight, calling nine, me. Eight, I'm not even going to answer, I'm sorry. Okay, sorry about that. It's coming from Cameroon. <laughs> All right, so food is not only essential for sustaining life, but also holds immense importance and significance in various aspects of our life. So like I said before, that food is love. Food is hospitality. Food is bonding. Food is beauty in diversity. Nutrition and health. Food provides the necessary nutrients, vitamins, minerals, and, and energy required for the body to function properly. A balanced diet supports overall health and well-being of our children and all of us, while poor nutrition can lead to various health challenges. We all know that, right? When you eat poor food, it's not healthy for your body. One way or the other, it's going to show up. It might show up in the future in the form of illness. That's why we want to encourage ourselves and all our children to do hard to eat 
our food now like medicine in the future. So that in the future, we will not be sick because we have already eaten our food now as medicine. So that in the future, we'll continue to eat nutritious food that will sustain and, and keep us healthy. So let's encourage, instead of going through fast foods and all those things, we don't know how it was prepared. We don't know the kind of oils that they use. We want to be able to encourage our children to eat food locally prepared, but healthy food, not just any kind of food. So nut uh, nutrition and health. Food provides the necessary nutrients, vitamins and minerals that we require, right? And then we have a cultural and social significance of food. Food plays a crucial, very crucial role in cultural identity, traditions, and social gatherings. Different cultures have unique cuisines, recipes, and dining rituals that reflect their heritage and history. Sharing meals with family, friends, and others fosters social bonds and strengthens relationships. It's good to share. You know, I was brought up, you never eat your food without sharing with somebody. If you know that you're not going to share your food, do not eat it in the presence of people. Don't do it. You need to share. And it's good to share food because sometimes... Sharing is it's it's a good thing. It's part of the culture. But what about somebody who does not have the food to eat? We want to share because some people are ashamed to ask, even though they are hungry. They don't have something to eat. They are they are ashamed to ask. But now that we are here, uh, on passive in one global movement, we want to make sure that we are sharing, sharing, and sharing, especially with children who don't have enough food to eat. And then what is the economic impact of food? Food production, distribution, and consumption are major components of the global economy. Yes, food production, distribution, and consumption, very major because it takes into account farm-to-market roads. It takes into account uh, the, 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 the weight of your pocket. Certain foods people cannot buy, now they resort to the very cheap kind that does not give them the nutrients that the, the, uh, their body needs, you know? And uh, it depends on a lot of things. Some of them, they have poor farm-to-market roads. I know that I come from a village that has that. It's so hard to get those food to the market. And if you don't have um, uh, 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 food preservation techniques, a lot of times those foods, they go to waste and they throw them. And thank God that uh, freeze drying technique is being talked about now more and more. It was there, but we didn't know because they didn't want people to know. Now that we're knowing, especially through Brother Smart, that is a good thing. And now we all, a lot of us are doing research. At least I'm doing research now on freeze drying also because you need to know the advantages and the disadvantages because some of those things children can be allergic to, we too can be allergic to. We want to know everything before we start using it or letting our children use it. So agriculture, food processing, restaurants, and related industries provide employment opportunities and contribute significantly to the economy of the world. Yes, to all countries, all villages in the world. So this is very important. And now we can also talk about uh, the emotional and psychological connection of food to our bodies. Food is often associated with emotions, right? Memories and comfort. Some people have their own comfort foods, you know, and then certain foods can evoke nostalgia or trigger pleasant memories like i was talking about the achu and the 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 uh, the the ekwang and the nangtar i was already just visualizing myself in cameroon where we cook in big pots and over the three stone fireplace with the bitter leaf right in our backyard we just harvest it to the kitchen so i was already thinking about that and then i started uh, salivating Oh, I started having saliva in my mouth, like I'm going to eat it, right? So comfort, certain foods can evoke nostalgia or trigger pleasant memories. While sharing meals can create a sense of belonging, really, it creates a sense of belonging and happiness when you share. 
When I share, I'm happy. That's why I always like to cook. When I see people that can eat, I love to cook all the time. So comfort foods in particular are known for their ability to provide emotional solace, emotional calmness, tranquility, emotional peace during times of stress or sadness. Comfort foods are known for doing that, right? And yeah, sometimes uh, this works even with babies uh, or toddlers. You know, some foods can really comfort them and it will lure them to sleep because those foods, their bodies have accepted is it as something that is going to just calm them down and put them to sleep. And now, number nine, we have food is entertainment. We see that all over the world, right? Food is entertainment. So environmental sustainability. How does it, how can uh, food sustain the environment? When we talk first about entertainment, um, we see food contests, right? Food contests, people are, they, they, they will see who, who eats the most food and who gets finished faster. For me, I don't like those kind of contests because I'm not going to be fast and I might choke. Because people can choke on that, and some people they end up throwing up too. So I don't, I don't get into those kind of things. But what about environmental sustainability? The production and consumption of food have significant environmental implications. Sustainable farming practices, responsible food sourcing, and the reduced food waste are essential for preserving natural resources. Uh, mitigating climate change and ensuring long-term viability of food systems. Now, we're talking about the environment. Because when we farm, we need to make sure that we know the kind of crops that we are planting, the kind of soil, the time, the best time to do it, so that we are also nurturing the soil. Remember, there is a season for everything. We don't just plant. There is a season to plant and there is a season to harvest. So all of these things are very, very important and they help to sustain the environment. The trees, we don't cut down all the trees because we will be destroying the environment because when you cut down trees, especially in areas where uh, they are prone to, to landslides and mudslides, then they're going to destroy the environment. And when that happens, then we cannot grow. And then other areas, they use a lot of chemicals Chemicals destroy the environment as well. And then other areas, the, 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 the burn the soil. Because sometimes when you burn it for a short time, it's going to produce good food. But in a long term, you destroy the soil. It cannot do well anymore until they nurture it again and give it the nutrients that it needs before it can continue to produce well. So that is very, very important to know. You don't just let cutting your trees because sometimes... Those trees bring you the fresh air. It also protects the soil and it, it, it also helps the wind not to maybe blow your roof off or in certain areas where the, the roofing was not done well. So that is very, very important. So we also dive into the, sim, uh, the symbolism and rituals of food. Food is important. It's a symbol. And they also use foods as rituals. When we see in the Bible, a lot of sacrifices was with food. Food sacrifices, it symbolizes a lot of things. You know, in my culture, there is a, a tree, very big tree. It's been there for, for, for more than 100 generations, you know. This tree, what they do is during harvesting, when people are coming from the farm, they have to place food under that tree. Why? Because a lot of people or some people, they're not able to produce food. And people already know now they can get that food to go and give it to those that cannot get to that, that tree. And those that can get there, they take. And these people are very nice. They just take, not taking too much or being greedy with it because they know that there are other people that will also come for it. Maybe it's uh, maybe um, uh, like, three plantains or two cassavas or two cocoa yams or a, a bundle of bitter leaf, whatever. They put it there. And this is a big symbol. It helps the village. And we just think that maybe that is a, a, a physical something that is actually spiritual. 
because that's the way you, you look for ways to feed your own, those who cannot do it for themselves. So food is often used symbolically in religious ceremonies as well. And uh, uh, religious uh, uh, celebrations, like in my culture, celebration, food, food, food. And I know that in other cultures is the same thing as well. And rituals. So it can represent spiritual beliefs, abundance, purity, or sacrifice, depending on your cultural traditions and the context in which you are cooking and, and eating this food. And whatever you cook, it depends on you, your mindset. What is it for? Is it for a good purpose? Is it for good? Uh, is it symbolizing something good, something that is going to help you and your family, or something that is going to uplift humanity? It depends on you. Whatever you put in there, the energy that you put in there, that is exactly what is going to be. Because, and uh, we've often said, uh, be very mindful of what you ask God for, because when you ask God for something. God will give it to you the way you are. So we are mindful of the kind of things that we do with food because we want to also try to avoid food waste. We don't waste food because I used to just throw things away like that. But then when I begin to realize that there are a lot of people suffering without food, I reduce that. I said, Lord, forgive me. I'm not going to waste food anymore. I'd rather just share it with people. That's why I cook food and take to people or I call people home here to come and take food. And now I, I discover a lot of people that don't have enough. Now I know people that I can just cook food and go and give them because they don't have enough, right? So, and like in my culture, we never, you will never, even right here in my home, you will never enter this house any single day without finding cooked food in the house because it's part of our culture to make sure that you have food 24 seven in your home because we believe we call people gods because people are little gods sent by God almighty that when a God can just knock at your door to visit you. And what do you do when somebody visits you in my culture, you offer them food, you set the table for them and bring out food and people who know they will wash their hands, they will sit down and they will pray and they will eat. It's part of the culture. And I know it's part of culture all, all over the world. And this comes to teach our, teach our children grace before meals, to say their grace before meals. And after that, they say their grace after meals. The way I was taught like, bless us, O Lord, and this which you have given, which we are going to receive from your goodness through Christ our Lord, amen. We say that before you eat, this is a good thing to teach our children. Very, very important because we cannot do without that. There is a spirit, whether we like it or not, whether we see God or not, it is there. And it is left for us to teach our children, but we cannot teach our children without doing it ourselves, right? So food is innovation and creativity. Food cultures constantly evolve throughout the ages. It evolved through innovation, especially the artificial intelligence innovation that we are a part of it already. And we're going to be seeing a lot of things. And then experimentation and culinary creativity. People who study uh, culinary arts as their, their, their field of specialty, they can... They can just, I have watched somebody just uh, did like um, a pineapple mountain, well decorated, and it was just steady right there. It was just a come and see. I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. So we have chefs, food enthusiasts, people who are so passionate about food are called food enthusiasts. And the researchers continually explore new ingredients cooking techniques and flavor combinations. How can we combine things? I want to make sure that um, we combine things in a healthy way, not just combining it because we want to make money. We want something that will be healthy for us and our children. And so this combination and reaching the culinary landscape, they're always coming. Things change all the time. New vegetables, new spices come to the market and new things. Some of our spices are, is the roots. Like we have uh, what is called for gang gang in my dialect. I don't know the English name for it. It is minty. It is sweet and minty. This is a traditional way of, uh, of, uh, of uh, appetizer. That's an appetizer. When you lose 
excuse me, when you lose appetite, you can't eat. People are sick, they can't eat. We just give them a little pinch. When they eat that thing, within 20 minutes, one hour, they're hungry. They want to eat. And now they start eating. And that is just a root. A lot of other things that can be done. So this is so important. And it is really, really uh, uh, being so creative and making the, the, uh, the food culinary arts and the food landscape so beautiful for people to want to cook to want to eat or to, to even teach themselves and teach their children. So this is very important. So let's start from, uh, I already talked about the ones in Cameroon. I'm not going to be repeating that. So Cameroonian cuisine, I'm just going to say what it is all about. Cameroonian cuisine is rich and diverse, reflecting the country's cultural and the geographical diversity. I come from Cameroon where we speak different, different languages. But the two official languages is a French and English. If you are, if you go to school, you must have to speak these two. And so that's what I, I went to school. Those are the two languages that I was educated in. But I'm fast losing my, my French. And Cameroon, uh, we have the French region and the English region. Because of colonialism, they divided the country into two. So that is the way things are now. So Cameroonian cuisine is rich and diverse, reflecting the country's cultural geographical diversity. And then uh, here we go. You are going to love these cultural delicacies. Now I'll talk about Ndole. Ndole is one of them. Ndole is a general thing for Cameroon. The ones that I talked before is specific for my culture. This one is a general thing. And Ndole is bitter leaf. This is a popular dish made with bitter leaf a type of green leafy vegetable. And then you use uh, uh, fresh peanuts, the peeled ones, and either fish, shrimps, or meats. It's often cooked as a stew and served with rice or boiled plantains. But some people can eat it with different things. I eat it with different things, not just rice and, and plantains. So you have soya. Soya is uh meat it's like a roasted meat it's like roasted roasted meat but it's not uh it's grilled it is well marinated you marinate it and keep it for one day with all the things i will have what is called black onion oh we don't have it here but we always bring it from cameroon the smell is good and we put it there so why soya originated in nigeria it came from nigeria See how we, we learn from Nigeria? It's also quite popular in Cameroon. It consists of uh, uh, skewered and grilled meats. I don't know what skewered is, but I think it is uh, a kind of condiment. And then um, it is seasoned with spicy peanut sauce. When you eat it, but don't eat it if you're allergic to peanut, you're not going to eat that, right? So, and then we have uh, fufu. Fufu is a stable food across West Africa including Cameroon. It's typically made from boiled and pounded starchy vegetables like uh, cassava, plantains, or yams, and serve as a side dish with soup and stews. This is so good. I would tell you at my job when I used to work with the, the corporate America, and uh, I changed the kitchen at that place because each time I bring my food, I share it with people pretty soon. And now they start uh, uh, contributing money, then we we'll, uh, we'll buy food, then I'll cook it at the job. Now that food, the whole kitchen at uh, Ramsey County was changed because of my food. The patient didn't want to eat their food anymore. We want to eat the food that the kind of food that Yvonne is eating. And I, I was the cook all the time now. And uh, when people are retiring, I will be the one to cook and people enjoy it. Some people change their family dynamics of eating only because of me. I love to cook. And that's what happened. So we have a lot of uh, uh, dishes. This one, uh, arrow, I really like to talk about arrow. Arrow is a leaf that grows in the forest. It doesn't grow anywhere else, but in the forest, it's natural. And just so you know, almost every, every leaf that exists on the surface of the earth is eaten by one person or the other. But some are poisonous, though. So arrow grows in the wild. An arrow is a natural anema. When you want to clean your system, it doesn't really make your stomach run, but it is going to, to soften your stool. 
Arrow is going to, it, it makes your body to glow. It, it cleanses your system. It also makes your body to glow. It is a natural source of fiber. Very good. When you eat it, it's good. There is a lady uh, now, she is in the uh, UK, and uh, me and her talked before she went to visit the daughter. She said when she comes up, please cook me arrow. I've cooked it for her about twice. She still just wants it. And I have some here that I bring from Cameroon to sell to people, which is very good. So it's a lot of good, good foods in Cameroon that we can just keep talking about. Ekwang, brochettes, and a lot of, uh, a lot. We've talked about Japanese sushi and Italian uh, truffles. Different, different. Uh, maybe Sharon, you will know because I think you have roots in Italy, right? And then we'll talk about France, foie gras. We talk about the Indian biryani, Indian biryani. I don't know what that is. And then Mexico mole, China, uh, China pecking duck. China, you know, they eat ducks, right? Thailand, Tom Yong Gong. Tom Yong Gong from Thailand. Wow. I can't believe I'm pronouncing these things. Spain, you have Jamon Iberico. And all of these things, they sound funny, but it's interesting that it's a good way of learning about other people's culture. So it's, it's prized for its intense flavor. All of these things are prized for its intense flavor. These things are very expensive, but they are good. We would rather just eat the right food, even though it's a little expensive. But now with on passive and other things that we are doing, it's not going to be expensive. We will be able to teach these children to eat healthy foods and do well, right? So this is so, so, so great to learn about all these cultural delicacies and to make sure that we are nurturing our children to eat right, eat the right thing because we ourselves are also eating the right foods, right? So thank you so much. Let me appreciate you all here, but thank you so much for being here today. Oh, wow. Other people joined. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Sister Sharon. I think you're the first person here, right? Thank you so much. And thank you, Ruth. You guys' support is so phenomenal. I am so grateful and uh, I am blessed and highly favored to have all of you here so that we can do this we can walk this walk together to reach to every child. And uh, Sharon says, hashtag one global movement. And we have uh, Gillian Momin. How are you? Where are the other Momin? We miss you guys. But thank you guys so much. I think you are here today to represent everybody. Thank you. We appreciate you. Thank you. And uh, of course, our sister Ruth is here. Thank you so much, uh, Ruth, for always being here to support us. We love you. And let us keep doing what we are doing, following the footprints of Mr. Ash Mufara to build a solid foundation so that we will be able to reach every child in the world. And, uh, and then we have uh, Shekhar. Stefan is here. How are you, Shekhar? Thank you so much for being here. We highly appreciate you. Thank you. And Ruth says... Hashtag One Global Movement, hashtag Dr. Yvonne Mundi, hashtag OnPassive, hashtag OConnect, hashtag Ash Mufare, hashtag Root Pace. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And of course, Nancy is here as well. Greetings, Ruth. Momin, welcome to One Global Movement, where we have lots of love to share. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Nancy again says, hashtag Ash Mufare. Hashtag on passive, hashtag Dr. Mundi, hashtag one global movement, hashtag advocating for our children, hashtag love. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And oh my God, Rachel Violet is here. How are you, Rachel? We miss you, but I know that you're doing fine. And thank you for joining us here today. We highly appreciate you. And Emma J, how are you, daughter? Thank you so much for being a part of what we are doing. Thank you. And uh, we have uh, Ralston McKenzie. How are you? Thank you so much for being here. If you're new here, we are here for children and young people all over the world. So thank you so much. Come again. We go twice a day at 1 p.m. Eastern Daytime and at 8 p.m. Eastern Daytime, which is what we are doing now. So thank you so much. And Ruth says... 
hashtag love, hashtag food, hashtag uh, cultural delicacies. Thank you so much. Of course. Thank you. And family, let's try to invite one person to watch One Global Movement with you together. We can help in uplifting our children, especially our little girls. Thank you so much. Yes, with a focus on our girls. Why? Because uh, our girls are always behind. They are on the disadvantage. Even women, we are. But so little by little, with the grace of God and peace, love, and happiness, we're going to reach them little by little. So thank you so much, Nancy. And we have uh, Cheryl Bess. How are you? Thank you so much for being here this evening. We highly appreciate you. Thank you. And we have uh, our man, Jan Barilla is here. Hello, everyone. Welcome to One Global Movement Evening Edition. Thank you. Nice to see some of our regulars here. Thanks for coming tonight. Yes, we thank you so much. And uh, and Shako is saying, uh, Shako is saying hello to Ruth, and uh, with the big thumbs up. If you haven't put the big thumbs up, do. And uh, I don't. If there's any new person here, please uh, like, share, and subscribe. This is uh, the least you can do so that we grow this channel. When we grow it, we are also growing it for children and nobody else for children because this uh, this account is for children only and a young adult between the age of one and 26 years old. So we need to help our children to thrive in life. And uh, Nancy says, I love cooking and I love fresh food, homemade. Yes, <laughs> yes, that is the best thing to do for our children, right? I love that. And uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Sheko, for all the, the, the trees, flowers, look at the cock, the fruits and everything. This is the beauty of culinary arts that you just demonstrated here. So thank you so much. Thank you. And of course, our arts uh, officer is here, Kushal. Thank you so much, Kushal. We love you and we appreciate what you're doing for One Global Movement. Thank you so much. And... Uh, Nixon is here. Hello, Brother Nixon. How are you? Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. We love you. We appreciate you. Thank you so much, sir. And we'll see you again. And uh, Nancy says, uh, Haitian black rice is delicious. Oh, wow. I've not eaten that. Are you going to cook some and, and maybe mail it? <laughs> mail it to me so that I can try it. I'm going to look for it too. Thank you so much for letting us know. So thank you guys so much. Uh, we've come to the end of uh, today's edition, uh, evening edition. I highly appreciate you guys. And let's meet again tomorrow if you can. Like I always say, make sure you're taking good care of yourself. If you don't take good care of yourself and your family, you will not be able to help these children because we have to, first of all, help ourselves in order to help other people, right? Right. Just like Mr. Ash Mufara is saying, help yourself and then turn around and try to help another person. Because if you don't help yourself first, you're trying to help another person, you're going to miss, you're going to miss it. You're not going to be able to help that person well to stand on their feet to do it for themselves. And then you fail to help yourself as well. And therefore means you have let your family down. So take good care of yourself. Come to One Global Movement only when you can come. We're not here for numbers. We are here for quality because to raise, to love, and to educate uh, children requires quality, not quantity. And thank God that uh, Mr. Ash Mufara and the building team are building products that are, are, are quality product and are also accessible and they are affordable. And so that is so important to us so that when you, when you strive for quality, Things will move faster and they will last for posterity. But we, when you don't strive for quality, you're just doing it to get quantity, or you're doing it to get uh, uh, to get uh, uh, to get sin. No, it doesn't work that way. Nature does not work that way. So take good care of yourself and your children and your parents and everybody around you before you come to one global movement. So thank you guys so much for being here today. And uh, uh, Shelly says, see you tomorrow, everyone. Thank you for a lovely evening. Thank you, Sherry Best. Thank you so much. Remember this. I always want to repeat it because we have to 
keep on repeating to ourselves and our children to always stay focused on what matters in our lives. Stay focused. We know that we have a mission to fulfill, especially the mission from, from uh, on passive that we are applying now in these various endeavors to get to help every child in the world. So let us stay focused. Let us stay encouraged. Let us stay empowered and always believe in endless possibilities. I love you all. I know good, good time, Paul, just <laughs> pop in. Hello, good time, Paul. We just, we just closed and we, I, I just made the closing remarks and thank you so much. Now you're counted here. You didn't want to miss it, but thank you so much. We were talking about food delicacies in various regions of the world. I didn't exhaust everything, but I was talking about what I know. Next time we all will contribute by bringing the various delicious meals of our various regions so that we can come together and talk about it so that we can begin to interact through food because food is love, food is culture, food is relationship, food is bonding, food is everything, right? So thank you guys so much. We'll see you again tomorrow. I'm going to go good night. And for you, those of you who are already uh, in Friday, have a, a fantastic, fun Friday. I love you all. Bye-bye.